This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. It is not intended to cause or induce breach of an existing agency agreement. Hello? 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 This is the Vancouver Commercial with a state podcast. And welcome back to the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Wright. And I'm your sometimes host, Matt Scalina. So we ventured off to Edmonton last week. We're back in Vancouver this week. Tell us, we have a great guest here all about ghost kitchens. This is Amrit Maharaj is on the show. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Coho Collective Kitchens. This is an amazing story. And uh, my heart often warms after these commercial real estate podcasts, I got to say. But this one is actually like, you think about it and you're like, man, what a position to be in, yeah. you know, to be doing what he's doing and the opportunities involved, like from a business perspective, but also from a, a small business perspective and helping immigrants, people that are following their dreams, right up to the Earls and Joeys of the world. Yeah. It's kind of an insane story. Well, a lot of people don't know what a ghost kitchen is. And obviously the explosion of the food apps. And he talks when they started the business, which I don't think you could have a better timing at all possible when this business model started, when they opened in March, 2020. Yeah. Is a ghost kitchen is someone that may not have a physical brick and mortar location, but might be available on an app like Corey's Coffee House, which you can't go buy it, but you can buy it through the apps. They're made in these kind of like commissary kitchen type buildings. And as you mentioned, they're all the way up to the Earls of the world where they now be able to open up locations in areas where they don't have brick and mortar stores, right, but now you, you can order the Earls on it online. Exactly. And I have a, uh, so this is how I think behind the times I am. I use those apps, but you mentioned, Hey, we have Amrit coming on the show and ghost kitchens. And I, I had an idea of what these were, but it didn't really hit like the full understanding of just the scope of this until I was in a Wendy's in Maple Ridge two nights ago. And I'll tell, I told you this, yeah, yeah. this was kind of an incredible situation. I walk in at six at night. I'm visiting a, a relative who's in the hospital. She wants a frosty. Yeah. Okay. This is the ice cream. Are you familiar with frosties? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I did my fries. And they, am I familiar with frosties? <laughs> I broke a Peloton. Okay. Like pedal. I, I'm I invented with, frosties. I'm familiar with frosties, <laughs> baconators, extra large fries from Wendy's. <laughs> So I'm, I haven't been in a Wendy's in years, not, not because I don't like Frosties, but literally I have not been in a Wendy's for years. So I, I go into the Maple Ridge Wendy's. Yeah, at the corner of Lowheed and Dooney Trunk there next to Envision. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. It's an institution. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in there and there's nobody there. There's nobody there at all. There's, but from Skip to Dishes and whatever the other Uber Eats and there's about nine guys with, with the, the warming The warming bags. bags or whatever, yeah. Yeah, standing on the side. And the place is like, it was like I walked in through the, I felt like when I was waiting in line, which I literally waited for like 10, 15 minutes before somebody, they were so busy, they could even ask me what I wanted. I felt like I walked into the back door and I was in the kitchen watching like 30 employees. It was, it was just jam-packed with people. They were scrambling and they were just filling orders for takeout. The place was dead. I was meeting my brother. I was texting. I'm like, I, I, this is crazy. So I'm behind the times, but clearly Wendy's needs a ghost kitchen is my point. Well, it's funny too. And this is one thing that, you know, probably, you know, literally probably even before COVID, this was starting out. And then obviously COVID put a huge emphasis on this, but it, it's a great opportunity for brands to test markets where they don't exist totally. or brands to go into markets, maybe where they don't have a physical brick and mortar location, but can go into a small ghost kitchen and service it. And on the show, we talk about the distance in which these food apps kind of circulate within, which is a five kilometer radius of their locations. And these, it gives brands the opportunity to go test markets and probably service markets for a lot cheaper than they could building out a $2 million, $3 million restaurant. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, one thing I left thinking, why on earth prior to these apps did Wendy's not deliver? This was a Tuesday at like 6.45 and it was so busy 
I just thought, man, what an opp- missed opportunity for the you last missed your 30 calling. years. You missed your call. Well, and here's where Amrit, Amrit had the foresight, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and it's great to talk to him today. So maybe we should cut to our talk with uh, Amrit Maharaj, the chief operating officer of Coho Collective Kitchens. Great episode. Enjoy, guys. This week's episode is brought to you by our great friends at Impact Commercial Group. Really enjoy working with Impact Commercial. And uh, we should say Al and his team can basically do anything when it comes to lending. Anything when it comes to under the commercial umbrella. You're building a building in development. We got you covered. You're buying land. We'll make that happen for you. You're investing in a property or multifamily building. Check. Owner occupiers looking to acquire their own space. Double check. Anything commercial financing you need, Impact Commercial is your go-to. Impactcommercial.ca. And we should say over 50 years of combined experience. So trust these guys. They're the right fit. Best in the business, in my opinion. Okay, so we're here with Amrit Maharaj from Coho Collective Kitchens, the Chief Operating Officer. How are you doing, Amrit? Doing very well. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me on. Yeah, it's really, really exciting to have have you on, Amrit, and thanks so much for your time. Uh, can we maybe start by you telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I am the Chief Operating Officer, as you mentioned. Coho Collective Kitchens actually started about three and a half years ago. I come from real estate development, and my partner and co-founder, Andrew Barnes, comes from tech. He was a senior executive at EA Sports for many years. Both of us were in our jobs and doing well financially, but we weren't fulfilled. So we wanted a something. We wanted to create something that gave back to the community. And Coho Collective Kitchens, a commissary kitchen, was actually born out of a food fund. So myself, Andrew, and a few friends who've done well financially wanted to give back to the food community. So we started this fund to help invest in local food products. We started hearing pitches from many different food producers, all different types, and they all said the same thing. There's no space to produce. It's not great. We're in the back of a kitchen of a restaurant, so we kicked out. So being an entrepreneur in heart, it hits you over the head, and our commissary kitchen was actually born. So that was three years ago, three and a half years ago. Fast forward to March 2020, when the pandemic hit and the ghost kitchen rise just blew us through the roof. We were already full as a commissary kitchen, and then restaurants really turned on the heat. They needed space to do their takeout and delivery only while their actual bricks and mortars were suffering from the COVID lockdown. So we just happened to be very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, it's it sounds that way, although right place at the right time, it seems like you, you definitely... I captured exactly the moment in a, in a really exciting way. I'm just curious, cool. Amrit, like why food? So your partner's at EA Sports, you're in real estate development. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did food even enter into the picture? <laughs> That's a good question. We've always bonded over food. So myself and Andrew have been friends for almost 20 years. He lived in Spain, running weather and divisions out there for a number of years. So visiting him out there and just seeing the food scene. I was very lucky to have parents that were always taking us to restaurants to try new cuisines. We were immigrants to Canada from Fiji. So they always wanted us to be exposed to new and different types of products. And we always saw, because coming from a Fijian Indian heritage, food was always a great connector. You always meet for family dinners, family functions, weddings. They're outrageous, as most people know, on the East Indian side. And Andrew experienced the same thing in his background. So food always was a great connector for us. And it's a great equalizer when immigrants come to a country it's a great way for them to get a foot in the door. If they don't speak the language properly, they can start a food business, operate a food operation of some sort. So we really connected and bonded over the idea of helping support and nurture that community just from our own backgrounds and our own love and passion for food. When we go traveling, we like to eat, love to try new restaurants when they come to town and want to be supportive of that. Big reason why we wanted to have you on today and a topic we've been looking to cover is ghost kitchens. And a lot of people have seen the explosion of the food apps but a lot of people may not know what a ghost kitchen is or how that even pertains to the food apps. But before we get to that, if you can ask your partner to in NHL 2020, Austin Matthews player rating was way too high at EA sports there. So if we can find out (laughs) what the metrics are on that, because I just got obliviated when I was him because he was not the score that they said they were, but we will cover that off. separately. That's that's, that's for after the podcast. But let's. Uh, I'm look. sure we got a few, few scotches over that, and then correct. But, uh, <laughs> but but what's a ghost kitchen? If you can maybe sort of let our listeners know what a ghost kitchen is, how that pertains to the food apps, and how's that how's that market just exploded? Yes. So a ghost kitchen is where a restaurant, whether they're a bricks and mortar like a cash club or an Earl's, does all their takeout and delivery offsite. 
they don't actually use their restaurant. They use a warehouse, say, for example, in East Van, in a shared kitchen space where they do all their takeout delivery orders from. So they realize the advantage, especially with COVID letting up, their restaurants are full. They're back to normal dining habits. Their kitchens aren't made to do another additional four or 500 orders a night. So they're overwhelmed. Then they turn to a ghost kitchen like ours to do the takeout delivery from our centralized facility. That's where these Uber Eats, Skip the Dishes, Fantuan, all the apps come into play. They work on a five kilometer radius. So any audience that is around one of our ghost kitchen facilities needs to be within a five kilometer radius to get that Earl's delivery. So Earl's might be downtown, but they're operating in East Van out of one of our spaces just so their East Van audience can get their food, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. And, and is it, so are your, I'm curious to hear exactly what your business does. So Coho Collective Kitchens buys yes. industrial space and leases it to to restaurants. Is that is that the, the model? It says, yeah, I wish we could buy the places. They're too expensive in Vancouver right now. We lease the spaces. So we take large industrial format warehouses and either divide them into one or two models. So the ghost kitchen model has micro kitchens within a big, large industrial warehouse. So we take a 10,000 square foot facility and put 20 individualized small micro kitchens within that space. And each of those is assigned to a different restaurant or a mom and pop shop that wants to create their own restaurant brand, doesn't have bricks and mortar, wants to compete with, again, a Caddick's Club or Earl's, have their own offering. They rent that space from us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That way they don't have to build the infrastructure. They don't have to wait a year for permits from the city. They don't have to spend 500,000 bucks up front. Literally, if we had space, within two weeks and a couple thousand dollars later, boom, your ghost kitchen is up and running. So just reducing the lower the barriers to entry and the economies of scale are huge. So we take those big warehouses and convert them. And just to get a better sense of the, and you're kind of speaking to your clients or the people who are, are renting these ghost kitchens, but it sounds like it runs the gamut from, hey, I, I want to, start a cake shop to yep. like the Earl's, the cactus yep. clubs. So you're, you're engaging the entire restaurant ecosystem, I guess. Oh, it, completely. We want to give a level playing field. We want to help everybody. We want to show that, yes, we're, we're a community initiative. First and foremost, we want to help anybody that wants to start a business, has a business is maybe a one restaurant place, has three restaurants, and then bring in the bigger brands because everybody benefits. The bigger brands help teach some of the smaller brands. And we make that part of being in our space where they collaborate. The bigger brands can help operate at a better efficiency and then teach the smaller companies how to do that. They also bring in group buying power, which we do for our entire facility. So if Earl's has a great discount on GFS or Cisco or some of the other suppliers, we pass that on to our smaller clients as well. So we really want to create an ecosystem where everybody can benefit. And there's gainful employment from both sides, small businesses and large businesses. So we want to make sure that it's level and equal for everybody. So from a visual standpoint, it's kind of like a WeWork yeah. for kitchens idea where these That's are right. smaller thinking, yeah. kitchens within a collective that people can then rent off that stuff. It is. It's funny. When, when we first started pitching, we used to use the WeWork as an example, and then we quickly got away from that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but actually, it's, it's the WeWork model, but, uh, but it strikes me as successful. You know, well, and also the <laughs> yeah. kitchen, right? Yeah. Like we work, it's yeah. like you can work from home. You can, you don't have to, yeah. you know, the ping pong table is nice, but you know, you can go without, yeah. but in your, your model is actually providing the infrastructure that you literally need to, to have the business operate. Exactly. From a commercial standpoint and from a health standpoint, like you can't operate out of your own kitchen or your house for, from BCH or Fraser Valley Health. Like it doesn't, it's not loud. So we need to be there for them. Matt's out of a job now because his uh, ghost kitchen at home is it's like I got to after this episode. My wife. Stop making those pierogies. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so this has obviously been driven by the explosion of the food apps, which probably got even bigger during yes. COVID because you couldn't go anywhere, but you could then order the food that you want come to your house. Maybe just from a rough percentage basis, if you have 20 kitchens, what percentage yeah. are current brick and mortar operations that are using yours from a location standpoint? to service the food app business? And then what percentage would be ghost kitchens or brands that don't have brick and mortar that only live online? Right now, it's about half-half, actually. So it's quite surprising. Even when we started doing the, the analysis, it's literally half is the bricks and mortar that want a space. And the bricks and mortar are getting smart as well. They're realizing that if they have multiple locations, they're not only doing the ghost kitchen takeout delivery, they're even doing the prep for their restaurants where they have one centralized space at our location 
to do all the prep and then send it out to all their multiple sites. That way they have consistency in all their products. They don't have to worry and they can actually lower their labor costs because they have less chefs involved. But then we also have the mom and pops that have an idea or people that have been just doing small scale and want to try a ghost kitchen brand and launch it online. And some have been very successful, which has been amazing to see. So it's been a really good mix and about half, half right now. Now, when you're looking at the big box boys of the restaurant business, and we'll use Joey's Cactus and Earl's as examples, um, are they sort of echoing to you that maybe, hey, we don't have a location in, you know, Abbotsford for argument's sake. We want to be in Abbotsford. We want to continue our partnership with you. You guys go find the space. And are they kind of saying, hey, this is a great model for us because we're now keeping our overhead minimal. We can now service the food through delivery and not have to have 5,000 square feet and 14 servers to do it. We can do it out of 200 square feet and a couple drivers. Exactly, because they've already got the trusted brand. People know their name. Once they see it on the app, and like I was mentioning before, apps work on a five-kilometer radius. So your production, whether it's a ghost kitchen or your restaurant, is not within that five-kilometer radius of your audience. They don't see you. So now Earl's Cactus says the big box boys, like you're saying, if they want to be an avatar, if they don't have a location, we can open for them. They have very minimal overhead. They don't have to take the risk. We take that on. They share the facility, which they're happy to do. And now all of a sudden, they've got a whole new audience in a whole new area. And as we expand across Canada, now they see the benefit. Okay, we don't have to put a bricks and mortar, like you're saying, spend $10 million and have our name in Winnipeg. We can just use a ghost kitchen, have it for takeout delivery only. Maybe it's a new market they're trying to test as yeah. well. And then they come to us, put their space in, see if it works. Some of them are even white labeling. They're trying new, new labels. See if the food is popular, where it's popular, using the metrics with delivery apps like Skip the Dishes, who we have partnerships with, to try a new market and see if that's actually where they want to be. Again, without that risk of opening a big box, having to spend their infrastructure, waiting for permits, literally within a few weeks, you can start. So it's really cool to see that advantage taking place and them understanding it again. Well, it's funny you say the five kilometer radius thing, because obviously I realized at some point there was some benchmark that they wouldn't deliver past, but because I'm in... Yeah the Coquitlam area up in the Westwood Burke mountain area. And I can't get cactus club on a food app because of where it's currently located. So when you guys are exactly. plotting future locations, if you can look maybe around like <laughs> Prairie and coast Meridian area for your next location and attract cactus club would be great. <laughs> I am a big fan of brewery Rose, So that is a good area to be in. There, there we go. <laughs> and Amrit, it seems like such a, uh, there seems like there's so much opportunity here. Yes. In terms of, I guess I have a couple different questions, but can you talk about, so you started three and a half years ago. I'd be kind of interested in, in, in that story, but maybe before we get there, can we talk about how many locations you have now? And it sounds like you're looking at least to, to scale across the country. Can you talk about kind of where you're at now and what the future looks like for uh, Coho Collective Kitchens? Thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting not to be that promotional guy, but we've got three locations right now and then growing from there. So we have one coming online in Gibsons very shortly in the next month or so. And then Victoria comes online after that. Richmond comes online after that. One in White Rock, two more in East Vancouver, just because of the demand that we have out here. Uh, to put it in perspective, in just Vancouver alone, we have a wait list of over 400 companies waiting to get oh. in. So people are really understanding the model works and growing with us. So we have, again, in our East Vancouver location, one of the spots has 40 customers, but they're realizing the ghost kitchen works really well for them. So they're signing up for all our next locations, which makes it even easier for us to open. And then growing across Canada, we are signing leases in Toronto and across other major cities in Canada, but I can't divulge too far into that. But we're really excited about the growth. So it is, it's something that's growing rapidly. We see a demand, but we've also created a great brand. And people understand our brand. They recognize us. Not only are they growing with us, this is one of the reasons we've taken on some strategic investors like the Aquilini Investment Group. Uh, we've signed exclusivity with Top Table to help take some other middle tier brands that are developing across Canada and across North America. So strategically, it's just been a lot of fun to work with all different types of levels and brands and organizations to see where our growth should go and match their growth as well. And in terms of the model, I'm just wondering what, yeah. what differentiate, and again, I, it sounds like <laughs> this isn't literally a promotional question. This is just from no, a, no, a business perspective, but what, what is the differentiator for Coho Collective? Like, how can you, ha, ha, this space seems like this seems so clearly an opportunity that I would imagine it's, it's fairly competitive. It is. And we're lucky to be starting with 
out blinders on. So myself coming from real estate development, my partner, Andrew, coming from tech, neither of us had a proper chef background. So it enabled us to see a grander picture, mm-hmm. whereas many of our competitors come from the cooking background, which gives you a bit of blinders when it's the actual industry. So we're able to see outside the industry, how do you actually make this work? And how do you make it work on a grander scale? So yes, there is competition. We're happy to have competition because it makes us smarter, stronger, faster. But without sounding pedantic, we actually care about our clients. A lot of our competitors are just landlords. They build the space, they give it to the client, they walk away. We actually want to help. Whether you're an established company or just starting off, we want to help give you marketing support. We want to help give you best business practices. A lot of times, chefs are amazing creators, but they don't have the knowledge that they need to be successful. It's really simple math for us. If they're successful, we're successful. So why not give them as much as we can to make them successful and even more? So just to create that gap between us and our competition and then going out and finding strategic partnerships as well. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can for every level, whether it's that group buying power that I mentioned earlier, where we go to GFS, we go to Cisco saying we have 110 companies. We're going to work in our space. Whoever's got the biggest discount, match that, and then everybody can benefit from that. So people have lower production costs because of what we're able to do in one big space together. Same thing with working with bigger name brands, just to take them across the country to give ourselves stability, but also that quickness to market. So a lot of things that we're just trying to develop or have already developed to make sure that we have that moat and make it bigger and bigger as we go across Canada and then across North America, and then also integrating tech into that as well, because tech is always a big play behind these things. So tech to help with the delivery apps, amalgamate them, make them easier. We capture that data, but also on the on the kitchen management side where things run smoother with our own tech platform, also running their ordering so people have a one-stop shop. They don't have to learn and phone 10, 20 different suppliers. They can just use it off our tech app. So creating all different levels of customer satisfaction has really helped set us apart. No, I, I apologize if maybe we touched on this earlier here. I've been making my resume here for your next location to hopefully <laughs> I can get accepted. Um, how many operations like, do you guys currently have? And whereabouts are those operations currently located? You got it. Uh, we got three currently. So one or two in East Vancouver. One is off Powell Street, just in the back of the Andina Brewing, if people are familiar with I have, the uh, I right. picked up a cake from there a couple uh, of <laughs> <laughs> there, I think there, I, you, they drop off Matt's mail at a Tina Brewing, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, I have well, I have picked up uh, oh, uh, from a bakery that operates out of there. I've, I've, that, yeah. That's us. That's us in the back there. That was our first proof of concept location. I come from the development background, so we both still had our jobs at the time when we opened that space. I know the city takes a long time with perverting, so we opened a baking-only facility. So no grease, no meat being cooked in there, and we're open able to open it really quick and that was a proof of concept and that one we permitted and built within three months had it open within three months it was it was overflowing and full so that was our first proof of concept we took over one in north vancouver just off of the second narrows bridge that was somebody that had a commissary wanted out so we were fortunate enough to take that position and then we opened our last location our biggest one so far at 10,000 square feet off east georgia street in east vancouver and that one has been really our big proof of concept. That's where March 2020, we opened. For the first two weeks, we oh, thought we were going to lose everything we ever built. And oh. then it just went it just went through the roof. And that one has our first retail experience as well. So we actually opened a coffee shop in the front of the house to help further create that bond between the community and our producers, where you come in, you get a coffee, big glass window, you get to see into the kitchen. If you don't know what a shared kitchen space is, you get a quick education for one of our staff. But if you do, you're there to pick up product, you're there to get a coffee. So just another vertical, but another way that we can integrate into the community by offering a different engineer. So this is another moat aspect for us where we have that front of house that ties the community in. Could you have honestly timed that any better? Like, did you call Dr. Bonnie Henry and say, okay, hey, this is going to happen. You're going to shut down the province. We're going to turn the lights on tomorrow. Okay, ready? And go. Like, could yeah. you have timed that any better? Exactly. It's like we just got horseshoes everywhere. And this, the further the pandemic went, we were just able to support more and more businesses. That's why the knowledge behind a ghost kitchen now isn't a hard thing to talk about. People understand what a shared kitchen is. It's more of where's your availability? When are you open the next spot? How can we get in? So it's a lot of fun to be riding that way, but also be at the front of it. And and can you talk about growing pains? Because my guess is, is that while everybody else, you know, painted a fence over the course of 2020, in lockdown, <laughs> you guys were probably running off your feet, right? Can you talk about some of the, yeah. the challenges and, and growing pains to get to where you are today? 
Absolutely. And it's no secret. Supply chain issues have been a big problem for everybody. We're not the only ones. If you're trying to order a car over the past couple of years, you've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Same thing for us with kitchen equipment, kitchen coolers, panels, these types of things. Everything's a big wait. That's our biggest stumbling block at this point. Uh, we've been fortunate to find some really key investors. So financing has been really good and helping pushing us along. But one of the biggest headaches we've had is that. And then also the startup, just learning having the right people in place, getting the right people in the right positions, understanding how to position ourselves to have scale across Canada without importing. Because we've seen other companies in the past that have done this really fast and it hasn't worked because they haven't had the right infrastructure as far as people go. So just finding the right people and taking our time a bit there is now finally paying off because we've got a great team in place and great support behind us. But it's also been a challenge. You find some people and they don't work out. They look great on paper and you keep going. So luckily, again, during the pandemic, a lot of people's time got freed up. So there's a lot more people to choose from. Unfortunately for some, great for us. But yeah, the the supply chain has been part of the biggest hindrance for us in that growth. Again, with 400 people knocking on your door in one city alone, it's just speed to market. I wish the city of Vancouver, I'm sure everybody else on these podcasts does the same thing, could speed up their act because we're just hurting businesses by the time we're open because we're taking so long because of city permitting, because of the time in office and the understanding of the concept we're doing and having to keep reteaching and reteaching. So it's much faster in other districts, which is frustrating, but the city of Vancouver just holding us back as well has been a, a big, big problem for us. It's funny you say that. We've, we've never had a developer come on yet and say anything negative about the city of Vancouver. So <laughs> there's a first for everything on the show. <laughs> Based on this success, obviously the concept is working. What's next? Have you plotted out kind of areas that you guys foresee future opportunities yeah. in that you're looking to get into these well, markets? And sounds like you you have a, a number of them that are kind of coming up soon. Yes, we have. And we want to be major cities, of course. Like Toronto just naturally is the food hub of Canada. It's just the population, the density, the amount of activity out there. We'll have five in Vancouver alone by the end of this year and the next, beginning of next year. We could have 20 in Toronto. There's such a need and such a demand out there. We put up a landing page just to see if there was interest. We had 2,000 companies sign up. Like It's just there's so much out there that we're wanting to tune into and help with. And meeting with the government out there now and talking with the economic commissions and people from the health authority, really understanding that they have a huge demand. That's one. So we really, again, because Canada is such a small place, but it's, it's huge geographically. By the end of this year, by the number of locations we have, we actually are the biggest by volume gross kitchen provider in Canada. And we just want to excel in that. We really want to dominate Canada. We want to make sure that we are the premier service provider in the ghost kitchen and shared kitchen space for it. And then we'll start moving into the States because there is also a large population down there that needs this. And we've been exploring and analyzing through our partners and through our own house people where we should plot first. But we really want to make sure that we're dominating Canada and providing the service that we started with that ethos that motivation of helping people succeed whether it's a small business medium business or big business but really targeting the big cities across canada so toronto montreal canada and then filling in the smaller ones as we go so now when when you're negotiating with these major restaurants are you negotiating for exclusivity with them or can can earls just go to bob down the street who's got the similar type idea and do it or are you kind of like working with them to plot it and grow along right alongside these big companies ideally yes we'd love for them to come to us we plot and grow with them we're happy if they want to try somebody else because generally they tend to come back like quite quickly because we're very proud of our product and very proud of what we've created but yes definitely it works in our advantage if we work with those labels help plot help show where we're going and where do they want to go if they have a space that they want to go that we're not plotting then we go do the research and start planning around it and start pushing that area so definitely very advantageous to us to work with those brands. And then it brings credibility as well when you're selling to smaller brands or people that are unsure about the space that they see a bigger label brand in there already or plotting to be in there, then it's a lot easier for them to take that step and understand us. And that's why landlords love us as well because we have that experience as we're opening. If they don't understand the concept, they see the brand name that's coming in with us. Landlords are more than happy to negotiate and be longer term leases with us. It's funny you say that, but go try somebody else because that's actually Adam's slogan in real estate. Is, sure, go try somebody else. I dare you. And then they just don't come back. So, so we, we're only picking on him because he's not here today. I'm probably going to get fired after this. <laughs> you know, Amrit, what, one thing that strikes me is, is that as, the, as COVID winds down, 
you know, there's the big, okay, back to normal, uh, which actually doesn't really seem to be happening in, in the world that you're operating in. But what, what in terms of, of kind of risks moving forward, do you, do you see for, for co collective or biggest risks, I should say. Biggest risk would be the very well-funded competition from global people. So Travis Kalanak from Uber, very famous fellow, not the best reputation, has secured a gargantuan amount of funding that we would not be able to touch at this stage. He's raised over a billion dollars to do this ghost kitchen across, but he started, he got money from the Saudi government, so he started across Asia, he started in Europe, and he's pushing across America. But what he's done is he's gone and gotten strategic, large name brands like Chipotle, McDonald's, and he just takes them and activates them very quickly into other areas around the globe. So there, nobody's really hit Canada yet. That's what we're trying to be risk averse from, like just make sure that we're across Canada quickly so these guys can't come in here because Canada's always that sleepy neighbor. Uh, so Travis Kalanick is one. There's another one called Reef Technologies. They got another gargantuan sum from SoftBank, who was the WeWork investors. They got over a billion dollars from SoftBank. But this is the brand that when you hear DJ Khaled's Wings or Mr. Beast Burger, it's actually through Reef. Reef is the one that's activating their brands and taking them across the country. They signed a 500 location deal with Wendy's. What they're actually doing is they went and bought Impark and a bunch of other parking lot companies and activated those parking lots as hubs for pickup and delivery. So they're actually using back-end kitchens like ours, the commissary side, but they're activating these parking lots and rapidly expanding other brands. So when you see a company, again, like Mr. Beast Burger, who's all of a sudden opened 300 locations overnight, it's actually through Reef. But again, Reef is concentrated in the States and across Asia and Europe. Nobody's really touched Canada yet. So again, the risks for us, the biggest risk for us is these competitors coming into Canada. That's why taking on the right investors, the right partnerships, getting across Canada the next two years, creating that wall really making that divide and then starting to go into the States and other places where people are competing, competing heavily. Now this sounds, this might be a really stupid question, but with Travis Kalanick's places down South, is it just Uber Eats that picks up from those places or can they, can they, can anybody? It's not a dumb question. It's, it's, it's not a dumb question at all. It's literally everybody. And even the public can go and pick up. Like if you just are within a radius, you can actually see their, uh, their own app and things that you can just go into their space and pick up them yourself. But it's Uber Eats, Skip the Dishes, all the ones, all the brands, everybody can pick up from the space. It's just same, same as ours. So what's next? So we're going to expand across Canada, eventually go into the States. Yeah. Do you look at expanding yes. your existing operations where you're building out bigger footprints because of the demand? Or is the game plan to have more locations similar sizing to what you currently have? Oh. It's like you've been reading our minds. We've actually been very lucky that with our past round of funding, we got a very detailed oriented finance team and they've really pinpointed where our ROI comes in at the best. And we are actually growing locations size wise as well as speed to market by taking defunct restaurants. So right now our average facility is about 10,000 square feet. That's actually going to bump to 15 to 20,000 square feet just because we realize our unit economics is perfect at that size. So that's really ideally what we're looking for when you grow to cities. But sometimes speed to market is more essential than building that facility because organic growth takes a while. So what we'll do is we'll take defunct restaurants, put some of our clients in there, manage that as a small ghost kitchen while our bigger facility is being built and then move them in after that facility is ready just because they need the space. We want the clients. Everybody wins. But we are changing that model so that we can move and quick quickly adapt to wherever we're growing into but realizing that that 15 to 20,000 square foot footprint is where our ideal situation is. Now, kind of, I guess as a, as a final question here, before we get to our six pack of lighthearted questions here with you, <laughs> is there any types of restaurants that are, are, are prohibited from coming into the space? Like, is there, is it Chinese food next to a bagel company next to McDonald's? Like, is there a certain type of, of food that, that can come is. in? It literally is. It's all those things. It's right next to each other. There's nothing, unless it's weed-based, we can't do marijuana-based because we're not licensed for that. Oh, um, Matt, you're out. Or, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anything, we'll, we'll literally put anybody next to anybody. Obviously, our infrastructure is that we put so much money into our heating, our, our cooling and our exhaust systems that the smells don't cross-pollinate so people don't have to worry about their Indian food smelling like Chinese food or vice versa. Right. So we literally put a pizza place next to a burrito place next to a donut place next to a so on and so on so there is no restrictions we want to make sure again that we give a level playing field to everybody and that's what's really fun 
And that's how you gain 20 pounds in a year by working in this industry because you just go around, everybody's still happy, you get to try different foods. If you linger long sounds out, like the peony with a roof on it. Exactly. I, yeah, I was going to exactly say that must yet. be the one of the biggest joys would be walking through at kind of oh, any yeah. hour of the day and going, oh my God, this is like this is like a carnival. Oh, it is. And it, you just learn that, okay, the bakers are in the morning. So if you want a fresh bread, come in the morning. Afternoons, guys are doing CPG products. If you want to try some really cool cookies and things, come that afternoon. Evening time, oh man, the takeout delivery is on fire. So all the guys that are producing really cool products and very unique takeout situations, you're fed very, very, very well. So we're very lucky to be in this, this business that's growing, but also very fun. So do you have a button on your, your Uber Eats app that when you push it, they're like, oh, damn, it's the landlord. Quick, get his food out right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bat, bat signal that goes up in the, <laughs> the, the kitchen. <laughs> Much easier. Well, before we let you go, we, will, we have a six-pack of lighthearted questions we got to ask all of our guests just so we kind of get to know you outside of the office here a little bit. Do you have just a few more minutes for us? Love it. Yeah, absolutely. Fire away. The six pack is powered by our great friends over at Red Point Law. Oh, the guys at Red Point Law are fantastic, Corey. For all your legal needs when it comes to commercial real estate, visit them at redpointlaw.ca. Okay, all right. We'll start off with an easy one here. Favorite vacation spot when you can find the time? How is that easy? It's such a <laughs> big planet with so many cool spaces. Just came back from London. That's an amazing spot, not only culinary, history wise. Got so much culture and so much fun. So I really love London. Same thing with Cape Town. Just such a beautiful setting. Great culture, great setting. Cambodia is really near and special to me as well. So just a myriad of places that always have good food, amazing culture, and great hospitality. Really friendly people. Fantastic. One book you would recommend all our listeners read, Amrit? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a really good question, actually. There's so many that come to mind. How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think that's been a great one for me. Coming out of my shell as an introvert and being able to be in a business where I love talking to people and love talking about what I do. That's been a huge, huge book for me. Pouring rain. It's a Friday night. What are you binge watching on Netflix? <laughs> what do I tell people or what do I actually watch? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. well, there's two things. Like, so over here, to give you an example, Matt's binge watching Riverdale, which he told me he didn't want to tell anyone that. <laughs> Just don't check my history. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Yellowstone, and that, that ended way too quick for me. So I'm still waiting for the next season. Uh, and then just just uh, music documentaries. I'm a, I'm a sucker for music, so anything musical related. I, I wish I could uh, join you there on the Yellowstone thing, but that's one thing. I, we've I, we've I, talked extensively uh, about Yellowstone. There, there's, <laughs> there's been a very, very hard line drawn in this recording studio for those who like Yellowstone and those who don't. So this could be your only time on the show. <laughs> it's a fitting end. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, music documentaries, favorite band or song? Favorite band, just because I'm a born late 70s, so I'm a child of the 80s, Guns N' Roses has been influential and just love them. So that's that's always been my go-to favorite band. Favorite song is actually Yesterday by the Beatles. No. Oh, so, oh we've had the just, Beatles on here before. A, no. It, it's it's something I grew up with in my childhood. Like My mom was playing it around the house. And just it's one of those songs that stands the test of time. I think it's the most covered song in music history. So it's just been something that always resonated with me every time it comes on the radio. Good choice. Uh, then this question is going to put you on the spot. We'll let you pick a few here because we're probably asking you pretty much <laughs> what's your favorite kid. Favorite bar or restaurant? <laughs> oh, man. Um Love Laue in uh, in Chinatown, Blind Tiger Laue. Like that that place is that place is awesome. Favorite restaurant? Ooh, there's so many. I mean, from casual dining at Nook, I love that one. Oh that yeah. Place. Kit, Kit's is really close to our house. Stable House in in, in South Granville, just as a cool little wine bar. Autostrada, and definitely for steak and indulging ourselves is Elisa Steakhouse in in Hilltown. I oh. love the atmosphere there, just the hospitality. So it's a bit of everything, a bit of gambit. And then I'm actually happy with a McDonald's burger as well. Like I've got no no qualms about saying that. I was just thinking you're going through all these like great restaurants and in my head the first thing that pops in I'm like Red Robin. And that's where I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to Red Robin. <laughs> bottomless fries. Exactly. And I, I will say this, and I didn't know this. On the kids' menu, it's bottomless mac and cheese as well. What? I did not know that. The, See, that's my my four year old ate the bowl and the guy came over and asked if we want more, and I'm like and he's like, it's bottomless yes. macaroni. I'm like, I am coming here every Friday. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just going to grab it some kid and bring him. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> what value. As a final question, Amrit, what is one piece of advice you would give someone looking to start a ghost kitchen? Ooh, interesting. One piece of advice to give somebody to start in a ghost kitchen. Maybe as your tenant there, so you're not creating your own competition. No, no, yeah, that's what we mean, of course. Yeah, somebody, somebody that's like, I have an interesting food idea. How do I get started? Yeah, what's the find the mentorship you need? Go to people you know, or come to somebody like us without promoting ourselves, and do it. There's no better time. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Without sounding too cliche on all those fronts, just do it. There's so much opportunity now with these ghost kitchens that are available. Again, I keep saying it, it's leveling the playing field. For a couple thousand bucks, you get to start something that might be your dream. You just don't know whether you have a corporate job. We've got guys that are contractors during the day and come do ghost kitchens at nighttime. Like they're literally building houses and they want to follow their passion, but they're not sure about it. Take that first step. That's where these ghost kitchens have great advantages. For a few grand a month, you can start, try, see if it doesn't work, see if it's actually your passion. You might grow it. Like, for example, we have had one Vietnamese company that started they're doing vegan pho and they've exploded they started two individuals part-time now they got five full-time employees and it only took a year and a half through the pandemic to grow it so just do it i think without hesitation it must just be such an awesome space to be in because the just taking that massive risk away for these people is uh totally you know it's totally. uh, like you said you know you can keep your job and uh and for a couple yeah. thousand bucks it's kind of a, unreal Exactly. And especially, again, just going back to my, my own immigrant story, my dad, when he came here, fully educated, couldn't get a job, had to start working in a hot water factory, hot water tank factory. Us having that advantage of being able to provide a space for immigrants coming in who might not speak English very well, that can create a food brand, have a business without a lot of overhead, help support their family, help feed their kids. It's so rewarding. It's such a cool space. We've had so many businesses like that start up. And for me, walking through there and being able to see this, that's ultimate reward. Yes, money comes, money goes, but being able to influence people, being able to help them, being able to provide that medium, nothing compares to that. Yeah. Whatever happens tomorrow, my eulogy sounds pretty damn good because we're able to provide that space for somebody. No kidding. Yeah, I love that kind of the the small business. It's fantastic. Well, well, thanks, Amrit, for your time. Today. Well, thank that, you. was a, that, was, that was such a great conversation. And how can people find out more about what you're doing in Coho Collective Kitchens? Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, both of you, for the time. It was so much fun. I really love talking about our business as a show. So you can find us at cohocommissary.com, on Instagram at Coho Commissary, Instagram at Coho Coffee, which is our coffee shop. We're opening a restaurant out in Gibson, so please come down if you're in the area or if you're a tourist. Please come support local companies, and local businesses, but at the same time, help support the ghost kitchen brands that are coming across. So cohocommissary.com will find you everything you need. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Amrit. Really appreciate it. Thank you both. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Thanks a lot. And there you have it, folks. Our interview with Amrit Maharaj of the Coho Kitchen Collective. Great episode. I learned lots. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, what an exciting space. And I feel like the combination of the business opportunity married with immigrant story, helping basically small time entrepreneurs live out their dreams, new Canadians. It's man. Plus being able to walk through these kitchens. I feel like that would uh, in and of itself. Like what's cooking here? What's cooking there? What an amazing business. And just so you know, because you look so stunned when I knew where that Tim Hortons Wendy's was, is I grew up in Pitt Meadows. So anyone that grew up in Pitt Meadows, the institution is there. I, I well, you you said, did, do they still have the the, the, the wobbly it, yeah, stare is, on is, the, is the door to the far left still have that mishap stare there? And then I mean, when you were there, was Carl still director of fry operations at Wendy's? Because growing up, you could pull into the Wendy's. You'd have to kind of say like the bird calls at midnight and you get a couple <laughs> extra chicken nuggets in your Wendy's burger. In your, in your, in your chicken it sounds nuggets like Wendy's. this is when you said an institution, though, it sounds like you've, oh, you've yeah. spent considerable time I, I used, Wendy's. I used to cash my IGA paychecks when I was like 15. They'd get to deposit directly into Wendy's <laughs> like account. So that way I had credits when I rolled through there. So it was, uh, it was, that's the institution out there. And just as an aside, Amrit mentioned Wendy's. It sounds like they're working with Wendy's because honestly, what went on Tuesday night at Wendy's? It was it was uh, it's kind says, of shocking to me, but clearly they need a ghost kitchen. It's, it's not Coho, working. It says Coho Kitchen Collectives all over it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So great episode, Corey. But uh, before we cut for the day, 
How can people interested in commercial real estate find out more about what you're doing over at William Wright? They can reach out to me anytime. They can send me an email, Corey at WilliamWright.ca. They're welcome to visit our website anytime, WilliamWright.ca. You can call our Vancouver office, 604-428-5255. Let us know what you're looking for. and we'll, we'll put you in touch with any of our great agents anywhere throughout the province to help service your needs. Fantastic. And you can also find more about the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast over at VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com, where all things real estate related live. We do have synopses, summaries of these uh, episodes on the website as well. Although for shows like this, I feel like you got to you gotta go to the source. You want to hear an Emirates story in, in real life. So VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com. And uh, I think that's all we got this week, Corey. That's all we got. But I, I will say before we go, just real, real quick, I've been catching up on my Vancouver Real Estate Podcast. And I, I just listened to your episode where you had Todd Talbot on. Oh, right. Did I miss the invite? Like this, you had Todd <laughs> you, Talbot. Like <laughs> You wanted to be there for that uh, one. I, I think it's the first time you've had him since we launched this show. Like I used to love, I still love. Love it or list of Vancouver. Still watch it whenever I can. I didn't know Todd. Todd did Todd sit in this seat? No. You know what? You're you're not sitting in Todd's oh, I'm seat. I'm gonna trade chairs. <laughs> it was super fun here. <laughs> you learn something new every day. I, I'm actually gonna be taking with me when I leave here. Oh the, yes, so the we have some swag. A frame carpenter pencil, courtesy of Todd. I'm going to take this with me and put it on my office. You know what? Take it. Yeah, we have some Todd Talbot swag in, in Kokomo <laughs> Studios here. Uh, so have a good week, everyone. We'll be back next week with Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. Subscribe today.